Sue, thank you for inviting me and thank you all for attending this afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here with you. I'm just going to share my screen. So today we'll be talking about a topic I'm very passionate about, which is heart failure. And heart failure is a little bit of a confusing term. It doesn't mean the heart's completely failed. It means that the heart isn't pumping enough blood and oxygen to the other parts of the body to meet the needs of our body and to allow us to do all the things that we wanna do. So it's an important diagnosis to be aware of because as we age, it becomes more common, but thankfully there are a lot of good therapies and a lot of things that we can do to improve and prevent and treat heart failure. So that's what I like to talk about today. So just to give you a little background on the importance and the significance of heart failure, as all of you know and have heard before, heart disease is the number one killer of Americans. And you know, heart failure isn't the only type of heart disease, but it is a large portion of the reason that, that we pass away. And so it's important that we identify it and recognize it so that we can prevent it and treat it appropriately. So I'm just showing you a picture here. This is a picture of normal lungs. And what you could see here is, is the white is different tissues. You see the heart border here, you see the spine. And then the black area is the air. And that's what air looks like on a chest X-ray. It's supposed to be black. People who have a severe flare-up of heart failure will sometimes have a chest X-ray that looks like this. And you could see there's a lot more white and even the heart border is kind of obscured by this picture. The reason that there's white in this picture compared to our prior, which shows more black, is that the air is filled up now with fluid. That's what can happen if we have severe heart failure, we can get fluid in the lungs and that triggers shortness of breath and it triggers a problem where we can't exercise and do the things that we wanna do. So besides feeling short of breath, there's other symptoms that we need to be aware of when we're considering a diagnosis of heart failure. So sometimes people, they tend to carry extra water in their body and, and extra weight. And the water can deposit in different places in our body. So sometimes it goes in our legs or our ankles and we feel swelling in our ankles. We might be gaining weight quickly and even though we're not eating more than usual, and that's usually a sign that we're gaining water weight. People who have this problem of heart failure sometimes feel okay when they're sitting up, but when they go to lay back or go to sleep at night, that's when they really feel short of breath. And that's because when we're sitting upright, gravity is gonna pull any extra water in our body down, you know, usually to our feet or more dependent areas. But when we sleep at night, the water equilibrates and that's when it can go into our lungs and make us feel short of breath. So in that setting, people often need to sleep with more pillows than they're used to. They can't sleep with just one or two anymore. They need to prop their head up almost to a sitting position. I even hear some of my patients say, I have to sleep in a recliner because if I lay back, I feel very short of breath. Another symptom of heart failure is when you lay down at night, you might start to cough because that fluid's starting to get into the lungs and irritating the airways. If you have a problem where the heart isn't pumping well enough to deliver blood to your muscles and, and your brain and other parts of the body, you might feel fatigued. You might not maybe notice any water retention, but you might just say, wow, I, I need to take naps very frequently. I really feel exhausted when I try to do simple things like, for example, walk to my mailbox or you know, walk up a flight of stairs, those things really wear me out where before I, I used to do them with ease. Um, and then, you know, sometimes people who are, are athletic or in good shape will say, I, I used to walk three miles a day. Now I have trouble walking a half a mile. You know, I'm, I'm really impaired compared to what I used to be. So those are things that make me think we should take a look at the heart. So when we're suspicious of someone having the syndrome of heart failure, we want to do different tests to either rule in or rule out the diagnosis. So I showed you that picture before the chest x-ray. That's a good test to determine if there's perhaps 
fluid in the lungs. Now, I, I have to, though, give you a little bit of a warning that some people who still have heart failure, they might have a normal appearing chest X-ray. And that doesn't mean that they don't have the syndrome of heart failure. It just means that we're not seeing the evidence in the chest X-ray. So if the chest X-ray shows fluid, it's helpful to make the diagnosis. But if it doesn't flu show fluid, we can't. We still, just based on that one test, cannot rule out the diagnosis. We do blood work to help us uh, either diagnose heart failure or maybe look for other types of pathology that could mimic heart failure. So we, a lot of times, will look for anemia because that's something that can cause shortness of breath as well. We check the kidney numbers, the liver numbers, and electrolytes. If we're not um, getting good blood flow to our other organs, sometimes the blood work will manifest um, that the liver and the kidneys are getting a little bit irritated. So we'll start to see those numbers creeping up. There is a special blood test we do to look for heart failure, and it's called B-type natriuretic peptide. And that's uh, an enzyme or a hormone in our body that increases when the heart is being stretched. So sometimes when we're suffering from heart failure, that number will increase. And then as we improve, as the, the condition improves and gets better, that number goes back down. So it's a nice way of either checking to see could a person be feeling unwell because they are having a flare of heart failure, we would we see that number rise. And also to see if they're getting better. If the number improves, that's a good sign that people are responding to the therapy. A cornerstone of what we look at as cardiologists is an echocardiogram. So that's where we put gel on the chest and we use ultrasound to take pictures of the heart. And it shows us the strength of the heart. It shows us the heart valves to make sure they're functioning appropriately. Um, and it, it, it gives us an assessment of how the right side of the heart is doing as well. So there's a lot of information we can get from an echocardiogram. And it's a standard test that pretty much all cardiologists do for most conditions. If the, echocardiogram, if the echocardiogram doesn't give us all the information we need, then um, a more sensitive test that we often recommend is a cardiac MRI. And that's um, something that could tell us, are there maybe infiltrative processes that might be explaining a patient's condition? Is there a sign that the patient maybe had a heart attack in the past? It can give us maybe more detailed information on the heart valve. So it's... Um, a little bit more of a longer test than an echocardiogram, and it's more expensive. So it's not something that we reach for first, but if we need more details even after the echocardiogram, that's a very useful test. The most common reason people can get weakness of their heart muscle in the United States is blockages in the coronary arteries. So when someone comes in with a new diagnosis of heart failure, and the strength of the person's heart is diminished, a lot of times we'll recommend a cardiac catheterization to make sure that there's no blockages in the coronary arteries that could be triggering the heart weakness. And if there is, and we fix those blockages, many times the heart recovers and the heart gets stronger. So it's important when you have a new diagnosis that we make sure that we're not missing blockages in the coronary arteries. And then a new diagnosis that we've been looking for more recently is this condition called amyloid. Um, and this is a condition people can get either due to the aging process or due to a genetic propensity. And it's where um, a protein in our body, you know, a normal protein that we all make, um, either is producing too much or misfolds. And we get depositions of these proteins in different tissues of our body. It could deposit in the heart. It could be de deposit in kidneys sometimes, in nerve sheaths. So some people might manifest with symptoms like peripheral neuropathy or carpal tunnel syndrome. Some people get back pain because it deposits in the ligaments in the spine. So when people have many of these symptoms, you know, some of these symptoms, we will oftentimes look for these protein problems because we do have good treatments to improve the, um, this condition. So it's another type of test that we might do in appropriate patients. So when you're looking at heart failure, when broadly speaking, there's 
there's two categories of heart failure. One is called systolic heart failure and the other is called diastolic heart failure. Systolic heart failure is when the strength of the heart is diminished. So I mentioned the echocardiogram before. When we look at an echocardiogram, each time a normal heart squeezes, we should eject about 60 to 65% of the blood volume with each heartbeat. Um, so with systolic heart failure, that ejection fraction is reduced. So sometimes people might only be ejecting 20% of the blood volume per heart beat. And then we would say their ejection fraction is 20% or 30%. Um, and then there's another type of heart failure where the strength of the heart is preserved. So they're still ejecting 60 to 65% of the blood volume per heartbeat, but because the heart muscle is stiffer, each time the heart beats, um, it had not the heart had not been allowed to fill as well as it used to because the heart is stiff. So even though it's ejecting 65% of the blood volume, the, the amount of blood in the heart for each beat is reduced. So the quantity or the, the amount of milliliters of blood that is ejected with each heartbeat is reduced. So you still, you have a lower stroke volume, we like to say. And the reason it's important to distinguish these two types of heart failure is the treatment approach differs depending on whether you have heart weakness or heart stiffness. So for the people who have heart weakness, um, there's what we call guideline-directed therapy. Uh, I, I like to say uh, guideline-directed medical therapy or uh, GDMT, I abbreviate it in my notes. And there's four classes of medicines that we use to strengthen the heart, to get the heart better. So the one class is the ACE, ARB, or ARNI group. So ACE stands for ACE inhibitor, ARB is angiotensin receptor blocker, and ARNI is an angiotensin receptor angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibitor. That's kind of a, a newer medicine that is proven very effective in improving heart strength. That's um, the only medicine in that class right now is in Trestoe. You guys probably may have seen advertisements on TV. Another important heart strengthening medicine is the beta blocker class. And for heart failure, we use three of them, bisoprolol, carvedilol, or metoprolol. So one of those three is what we tend to use in people with weakened hearts. There's a class of medicines called mineralocorticoid antagonists. So a common medicine we use in that class is spironolactone. It has a little bit of a diuretic property, but mostly we use it for the heart strengthening property. And then a newer heart strengthening medicine we've been using is a class of medicines called the SGLT2 inhibitor. So that stands for sodium glucose co-transport inhibitor. And these medicines were initially designed for people with type 2 diabetes, but they've been doing extensive cardiovascular outcomes trials on these medicines. And what we found is it's really beneficial for people with heart conditions. So it prevents heart attacks. It prevents heart failure hospitalizations. It helps people to live longer when they have heart conditions. So we're using it frequently for people who have heart failure, both with and without diabetes, even people without diabetes benefit from this medicine. And we've added it to our arsenal of guideline-directed medical therapy. Sometimes people with weakened hearts can get stronger hearts if we use special pacemakers. So we collaborate a lot with our electrophysiology team and an appropriate patient sometimes will recommend a pacemaker. And then in people who have weakness to the heart in, in some patients, a defibrillator has proven to be beneficial and, and help people to live longer. So those are definitely therapies we use frequently. And then there's new device-based therapies that we're using as well. The CCM stands for cardiac contractility modulation. And the Barostim is um, a stimulator of the carotid sinus that, you know, believe it or not, actually helps improve heart strength. So these are two devices we've been utilizing to help people who haven't responded as well as we want them to, to the, the drug-based therapies. As you can see for the systolic and the diastolic group, um, we use the medicine called diuretics uh, or water pills. And those help get rid of any extra water patients might be holding on to. So we use those medicines for both classes of heart failure and they're important for symptom management. 
They don't, the diuretics don't actually help people to live longer though. The ACEs, ARBs, ARNIs, beta blockers, mineralic corticoid antagonists, and the uh, SGLT2 inhibitors, those will prolong people's lives. So those are medicines I'm pretty aggressive about getting on people's lists because I want them to live longer. The diuretics help with symptom management, but once you get your water balance to a good place, we try to reduce the diuretic dose if we can because um, it doesn't improve mortality. And my philosophy is let's keep our med list as short as possible. And we don't wanna give meds if we don't need them. For the heart stiffness problem, uh, it's a common problem, especially as we get older. All of us at some point may get some heart stiffness. And we don't have a lot of great therapies to reverse the stiffness. The best thing you could do to prevent heart stiffness is exercise. Exercise will prevent your heart from getting stiff. But if your heart is already stiff, it's important to get evaluated because if there's a secondary cause of the stiffness, for example, like that amyloid condition or a protein problem that we talked about, we could definitely treat that. And then we wanna make our other medical conditions that we're dealing with as perfect as possible. So we wanna keep our blood pressure in good range. If we have any sort of atrial arrhythmias like atrial fibrillation, we wanna keep that as good as possible. We wanna make sure we don't have things like anemia that can contribute to shortness of breath and make sure that we keep our kidneys as healthy as possible. So regardless of the type of heart failure, I know I just outlined, you know, we have different treatments for the heart weakness compared to the heart stiffness, but overall important treatments for all kinds of heart failure are we wanna refrain from smoking. So if we smoke, we wanna stop. We want to really focus on a good, healthy diet. So I, I like to teach my patients about a plant-based diet. You want to eat as many fresh things as possible, fresh fruits, vegetables, whole grains, lean meats. Try to avoid processed foods because processed foods tend to have a lot of sodium. And when you're suffering from heart failure, where the salt goes, the water goes. You're going to retain more water if you eat too much salt. So eating homemade, fresh things is much healthier for us than getting takeout food or eating things from boxes or, or um, frozen dinners, for example. I advise our patients that if you're reading a label and you see that the serving size has more than 140 milligrams of sodium per serving, that's too much. I would avoid that food because you're gonna start to retain water. For people who have um, reduced ejection fraction, that's systolic dysfunction, or people who've recently had heart surgery or stents or something like that, um, Medicare will pay for cardiac rehab. And that's a wonderful therapy for people who have heart conditions. Exercise is one of our best medicines. So I encourage anybody who qualifies to go to cardiac rehab. And we have a, a wonderful program at Valley the um, cardiac rehab nurses are experts, they're motivational, they get people on an excellent regimen, and, and most of our patients who participate end up sticking with it, which is really important. It's important that we're up to date on all our vaccinations because um, when you have a heart condition, you tend to, um, you're more susceptible to infections and you can get sicker when you do get infections. So we wanna stay up to date on our vaccines. And then, Sometimes um, in people who have heart failure, the um, condition sleep apnea is associated with that. So for people who complain that they're tired a lot or that they're snoring when they sleep, I recommend they're evaluated uh, for sleep apnea. And if we identify it and we treat it, often patients feel a lot better and it does help their heart to get stronger. So at Valley, we take heart failure very seriously. Uh, I like to say if I meet a patient and they've been hospitalized for heart failure, that's a sentinel event. That is a big deal and we need to take it seriously. And we need to really be aggressive about getting their heart better and getting their lives um, so that they can get, get their control back because it's, it's a terrible feeling to not be able to breathe and to need to be in the hospital for heart failure. So we really, when, when that happens, we wanna prevent that from happening again and let people live um, a good quality of life doing the things that they wanna do. So because of that, we have a center at Valley called the Center for Comprehensive Heart Failure Care. It's on the second floor of the Phillips Building in Valley. And 
um, it's staffed by myself and nurse practitioners as well as registered nurses. We do a lot of teaching. So when patients come in, we'll get vital signs. We check blood work to make sure kidneys and electrolytes and blood counts are all in the normal range. We'll do an exam. If we need to um, titrate or increase any of the heart strengthening medicines, we do that. We really um, try to empower patients so that they learn as much as they can about their condition so that they can prevent any future flare-ups and they can get their heart back to normal. And then as we talked about before, cardiac rehab is an important component of keeping our heart healthy. And this is just a picture of our team. This was recently posted on social media. I'm not sure any, if any of you had seen this, but um, we have uh, an excellent team. All ladies, we're, not that we're discriminating against the men. We'd love if we had some men to join our team, but right now it's comprised of all ladies and uh, it's an enthusiastic, pa enthusiastic, passionate group of people who really care deeply about our patients and really want our patients to live full, healthy lives. So, you know, as we talked about, we have a multidisciplinary team of, of different types of providers. We have pharmacy, pharmacists available to help with medicine, social workers if needed. Um, I talked about our nurses, our pharmacists, um, for patients who are not feeling well and who would like to come and see us but maybe don't have a ride, we have a mobile health unit that will go out to a patient's home and do an exam. And if the patient needs, for example, IV Lasix because they're retaining water, the mobile health unit can give that medicine. They'll sit with the patient for a half hour, make sure he or she responds. And then, you know, when the patient's feeling better, they go home. So this is a wonderful service that Valley offers. It's actually free. You don't get charged for this. So if that's something you or anybody in your family would benefit from, please let us know and we can certainly explore that for you. We partner with Valley Home Care. A lot of our patients who've been recently discharged from the hospital are getting telemonitoring services. So the home care um, nurses will let us know if any of their vital signs are, are looking concerning and we'll address it right away. And then we also partner with people in the post-acute rehab centers. If a patient who was recently hospitalized with heart failure is in a post-acute center, we like to keep our eyes on them and make sure that they continue to get better and go in the right direction. And when we go home, we see them in our comprehensive heart failure clinic. And our program's high touch. You know, we, we like to be available via phone for our patients. Um, if there's any questions, we, we like to address them right away and be available for you because we know it's scary and it's hard to be diagnosed with this condition. And we wanna to try to make it as easy as possible. So just you know, to review some of the services we offer, um, our heart failure team sees patients on the inpatient side. We help with patients who are in shock. We help with people who have pulmonary hypertension. We talked about our amyloid program. We were aggressive about screening and treating that. We work with patients who have heart conditions and who also are, are battling cancer. So if um, any sort of heart conditions arise for our patients receiving chemotherapy, we're right there to help keep the heart healthy so that the patients can continue receiving their needed chemotherapies. There is a little computer chip that some patients will get implanted in their pulmonary artery. It's called a cardiomems. And each day they'll lay on this special pillow once a day and they'll send a reading of their water balance to us. And we can follow them and make sure that their water balance isn't changing or creeping up. And if so, we call them and we say, Mr. Smith, you need to take an extra dose of water pill today or oh, your water numbers look good today, you can skip your dose. And it's an elegant way of managing the diuretics um, so that we don't overtax the kidneys or cause people to get dehydrated. Some people who have severe heart failure um, end up needing a heart pump to help them um, so that they feel better. That's called a left ventricular assist device or an LVAD. We don't implant those here at Valley yet, but we do partner with some tertiary care hospitals in, in our vicinity. And if people do get LVADs, but they live around us, we do a shared care model so that we can see them um, usually every other month so that the patients don't have to be traveling to New York City so frequently. Um, and then we're, we have a robust clinical trials program. So we're always trying to innovate and stay on the cutting edge. And we have 
newer innovative therapies available to our patients so that um, people who aren't doing well with their traditional therapies have other options. And as I mentioned, we collaborate with our electrophysiology colleagues, cardiac surgeons, our structural heart doctors so that we can help people with valvular problems and uh, other heart failure centers in the area. So just to conclude, you know, when you're diagnosed with a condition like heart failure, it could feel scary. You could feel like you're all on your own and you're, you're dealing with this, this condition that, that is so overwhelming. But I want you to know that it takes a village and we have a village here at Valley to help you. And you're not alone. It's a common condition. We're very experienced treating it and we're, we're happy to help you with any of your cardiac needs. So if you have any questions, this is my phone number and my email, and I'm happy to talk to any of you or see any of you or your family members. So please keep in touch. And uh, with that, we'll take questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Abbott. That was really comprehensive and, and very interesting. Um, here's a question that I, is something that I'm, I'm interested in too. Is there a difference between heart failure and congestive heart failure? Are they, are they the same thing or? Oh, that, that's an excellent question. So I kind of look at them as the same entity. The congestion piece of it is meaning um, people who are filled with fluid or have extra water on board. So when someone comes into the hospital and they have congestive heart failure, it means they probably have extra water and we're gonna use aggressive diuretics to try to get that extra water out. Um, heart failure is a syndrome and I usually think of it as people who do have this, this problem of, of carrying extra water or feeling short of breath. If people are compensated and they don't have extra water, they might still have a heart condition, like for example, a cardiomyopathy or a weakness to their heart or a stiffness to their heart. But I guess I wouldn't use the term heart failure to describe what they have at that time if they're compensated. Heart failure is kind of, um, it's a fluctuant condition. You know, Sometimes people might not have any symptoms of it. And then I guess you would say that they don't have heart failure at that time, although they still might have a condition that we need to keep an eye on. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, someone's asking if um, you recommend a coronary calcium CT scan. Yeah, so that's an excellent question. Um, I actually recently got one myself. Um, so coronary calcium scores are good for people who you aren't sure whether or not they have coronary disease. Um, so if you've had a CAT scan in the past, you could probably just look at that and we could determine whether or not you have calcium in your coronary arteries. But if you've never had a CAT scan and you maybe have some risk factors for heart disease, but you've never been diagnosed with it, then you are probably an appropriate candidate to get a coronary calcium score. And the power of the test is zero. So if you get a coronary calcium test and you don't have any calcium in your coronary arteries, that means that you know you you don't you don't likely have plaque or any significant plaque because the calcium is a marker for plaque in our arteries. If we see any calcium at all in the coronary arteries, that means we have some plaque in our coronary arteries. And it's common as we age, you know, we eat this this Western diet. So as we age, you know, most of us at some point will get some plaque in our coronary arteries. So if you see any plaque at all, I usually recommend at that point that people take a statin um, to help prevent any future plaque deposition. If you have a lot of calcium in your coronary arteries, that may signify you have a lot of plaque and then your doctor might wanna even do some further testing. But I, I would say if you get a zero, that's that's really what we're looking for. That's the best case scenario. And that indicates that your risk is very low. Okay, thank you. Um, someone's asking if there are any studies between those who have, whether it be um, heart failure or cardiac issues and depression. Ah. She post-surgery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at, excellent question. That's, that's a really thought-provoking question. So... Um, I'm not sure. I don't know of any data that says people who have depression are more at risk for heart failure. However, there is one type of heart failure or cardiomyopathy that is triggered by emotional stress or um, emotional upheaval, upheaval. It's called Takasubo's cardiomyopathy, um, or we call it the broken heart syndrome sometimes. So th this can occur if 
for example, if you've just learned of a death in the family or, or sometimes if, if something shocking happens in your life, um, you, your heart can develop this heart weakness that's temporary and will get better over time. Uh, but that has been, uh, there is a link between that. And people who do have heart conditions, whether it be heart failure or have had a recent heart attack or heart surgery, depression is a common comorbidity that we see. And it, and it tends, they, they, we do see that occur frequently together. So we do screen people who have heart conditions for depression and we're pretty aggressive about treating it because if you treat the depression, it does help them heal better from their heart condition. Very interesting. Someone's asking, um, what is your position, if any, on the current vaccines vis-a-vis -vis coronary heart disease? Yeah, so that's a really interesting question too. So um, when anybody has a heart condition or any sort of, of health issue, like a comorbidity, like hypertension, diabetes, heart disease, um, they're more susceptible to infections like COVID-19, for example. So we advise all of our patients to get the COVID vaccine. I, I haven't encountered anyone where I said you shouldn't get it because the risk of getting the, the infection is, is so severe and the vaccines have pr proven very safe. You know, we've, we've given them out to billions of people so far and there's been very few reactions. So um, there's no risk of getting coronary disease from a vaccine. There's no risk of getting heart failure um, from the vaccine. So they're, they're very safe. Okay, and just along those same lines, do you know of any studies regarding um, the um, COVID-19 affecting um, cardiac health or those more susceptible to cardiac health? Yeah, uh, so it doesn't, you know, nobody's, I haven't encountered anybody who's had any adverse reactions from a cardiac standpoint from the vaccine, but you know, we do encounter people who have heart disease, who get COVID-19, who get very, very sick from it. So I think that the vaccine has been safe for all our patients who've gotten it and their heart disease has been very stable. Um, but if they do get COVID, that, that certainly can destabilize people. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Abbott. This was really wonderful. Thank you for taking your time. 